Well, randomized trials are really the only valid way to assess the impact of a treatment. And the reason for this is that when we don't randomize, there's all kinds of confusion that's created by what we call confounders, various other types of factors that uh, impact on treatments and outcomes. And the only way that we can get rid of this noise, so to speak, is by randomizing. I'll give you an example of a study that we're doing right now at, um, at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Uh, we're wondering whether or not it's more appropriate to treat high blood pressure aggressively to get people who have high blood pressure get their blood pressure down to 120 or whether it's okay to get their blood pressure down to 140 and that's all that one has to do. So the way that we're answering this question is we're doing a, a big randomized trial called SPRINT. We're going to take about 10,000 people and we're going to randomize them to very aggressive blood pressure control or more conservative blood pressure control. And then we'll see what happens. We're going to see how many people have strokes, how many people have heart attacks, and that will answer for us whether or not more aggressive blood pressure control is, is better or not. Well, the most important thing is to make the trial big. Um, when you have large numbers, um, the likelihood of biases goes down. Now, there are some other things that one has to do as well. Uh, if one is testing drugs, one, uh, one will compare against the placebo and one uh, engages in a practice called double blinding, whereby neither the patient nor the doctor knows what treatment they're actually getting. Uh, we also, when we follow people over time and make judgments about whether or not they have events like heart attacks or strokes, we try to make those judgments in a way that's blinded to the uh, treatment assignment that a person got. So the, the uh, investigator is trying to determine whether or not a person had a heart attack or stroke does not know what they, uh, which, which arm they were uh, randomized to. So uh, blinding as well as very large numbers, these are probably the two most important things that we do to um, reduce the risk of bias in randomized trials. Most of the time when one argues that it's impossible to do a trial, it actually is possible to do a trial. It's just that people don't want to do it. And arguably it is more costly not to do a trial and uh, live in an era of uncertainty for many, many years than to uh, than to go ahead and, and, uh, and do the trial. Um, if one is truly unable to do a trial, then observational studies might be an acceptable substitute if they're done very carefully and, and with appropriate steps to uh, minimize bias. But most of the time, the, the right answer is figure out a way to get the trial done. It's less the issue of patients not wanting to participate. It's more the issue of the, uh, the medical profession not wanting to participate. And I'll give you a great example. We did a trial recently called the Occluded Artery Trial where we randomized people to get a stent after a completed heart attack or not. And 91% uh, of the refusals for that trial came from physicians. It did not come from patients. Uh, what's interesting is, is that about uh, two-thirds of Americans um, are interested in participating in clinical research and say that they would participate in clinical research if they were asked. But then if you ask them, uh, how many of you have actually ever been asked by a doctor to participate in clinical research? It's only 6%. So we have a, a big gap here in that most of uh, medicine is being practiced outside of the realm of, of clinical research. And I think that's really what, what the major problem is. What we need to do is somehow inculcate a culture of research into all of medicine. And if we were to do that, I don't think we would have any trouble finding patients to participate in studies. Well, I, I think that this is one role that, uh, that the whole community uh, that's involved in research can, uh, can, can engage in, government and uh, industry and uh, academia and foundations, that w we need to recognize that this problem actually exists and then, uh, and then actually take it on. Now, there's some really beautiful examples where this has been done successfully um, in the world of um, uh, pediatric oncology. Uh, we have a culture in which 80 to 90 percent of children with cancer get enrolled into trials. That's become part of the existing culture. Uh, we've seen uh, movements such, for, such as, for example, in breast cancer, where uh, there is a direct appeal to patients to, and people who are at risk for becoming patients to, um, to get involved in research and, in a way, almost bypass um, doctors. And I think that if, if we see more of this type of thing whereby we, we reach out to the community and we reach out to, um, to patients and suggest to them that research is a way to move things forward, uh, we will be successful in bringing the culture of science into the practice of medicine.